Hello, hello. So let's talk about the path pathology. I'm going to start anatomically, so I'm going to start outside in. So the vulva is the, all the female external genitalia, distal to the hymen, and is lined by squamous epithelial lining. That's actually kind of important, so we're going to underline that. Uh, the first piece of pathology here is the Bartholin's gland cyst and abscess. Uh, Bartholin's glands are right here at the 5 o'clock and 7 o'clock location, located right under the skin. And the glands secrete fluid, and the fluids leave the glands by these two little ducts right here. Okay, so if these two ducts get blocked, what happens? Obviously, it's going to swell up like a balloon, and that's a cyst. That's the Bartholin's gland cyst. If this cyst gets inflamed for some reason, infected, that's an abscess. It's based, abscess is like a ball of pus and bacteria. And if we know this, we basically know the presentation. Abscess, like every other abscess, is going to be painful. So you're going to present, you're going to basically have a woman with a cystic mass at the 5 o'clock and 7 o'clock location, or they might tell you it's in the lower parts of the vagina, and it's going to be painful. And the treatment is, if you just think of an abscess, what do you do? You basically drain it. That's, all, that's what you always do. Um, antibiotics don't cut it because they can't, they can't reach the inside of the abscess, so you got to drain it. All right, so lichen sclerosis. Pathophysiology here is key. It is the thinning of the epidermis and sclerosis, um, another word for fibrosis of the dermis. And it's due to chronic inflammation. So symptoms we can pretty much derive again. Chronic inflammation uh, presents with, what do you think? Itching and pain. Now sclerosis, if you think about it, it's basically hardening, tightening up of the tissue. So if you take a piece of skin and you tighten it up, What's going to happen? It's going to wrinkle up. That's exactly what happens here. You're going to see the let's look at this picture here. You can see the skin. It's kind of wrinkled. You see that? It's basically cigarette paper like. It's very thin. It's a whitish thin. And you're going to see is you're going to see an older woman. Okay, so severe itching, pain, crinkled paper like skin. The treatment here is again goes back to the fact of physiology, chronic inflammation. How do you treat it? High dose steroids. And for prognosis, this is benign, but you get a slightly increased risk of squamous cell carcinoma. We'll talk about that in a sec. Now, a similar condition that can be easily confused is lichen simplex chronicus. The way I just, I like, I just remember lichen sclerosis because of the sclerosis that tells you the pathophysiology. And from there you get the presentation and you get the treatment. Lichen simplex chronicus is hyperplasia of the vulvar squamous epithelium. It's a result of chronic itching and scratching. It's basically an uh, itch-scratch cycle. You get itchy, you scratch yourself. Scratching causes mast cells to release histamine. You get even more itchy. You want to scratch yourself again, and it's not, not good. No bueno. This one, in contrast, is benign. There's no increased risk of squamous cell carcinoma. That's important. Now, presentation. I don't know if you ever scratch yourself a lot, yeah, but I have. And basically what happens, your skin thickens up. Not good, but that's what happens, and that's exactly what happens here. You're going to get a super itchy woman. Um, she's going to have thick, leathery skin in the vulva. This is actually not the vulva, but I just wanted to I use it to illustrate. And you get this thickening and leathery skin, and that's basically because they're scratching themselves so much. So let's talk about HPV a little bit. Uh, this is a little bit more background than anything for um, cancers of the vulva, va vagina, and cervix. So it's sexually transmitted, it's a DNA virus, and it, it likes the squamous epithelium of the external genitalia and the anal region. Uh, so that can actually be male or female, so it can be vulva, vagina, penis, anus. There's a bunch of different types of HPV, 4, 6, and the ones we're talking about 6 and 11, and 16 and 18. 6 and 11 lower numbers have low risk of cancer, low risk cancer. And they mainly cause genital warts. Okay. 16 and 18, they're higher numbers. They have high risk of cancer. And the way they do that is they make two proteins. They make E6 and E7. E6 happens to block P53. E7 blocks RB. Remember, these two are su super important tumor suppressor genes. These are the, this is the guardian of the cell cycle. And this is guardian number two of the cell cycle. It's kind of hard to remember. You kind of have to remember which one does which. I like to remember E6 and P53 because I just 
for some reason I remember that E6 and P53 do not add up to 60, so they go together. E7 then blocks the other one, which is RB. So these, these infections cause inflammation. They eventually can lead to dysplasia and then eventually lead to cancer. And all infected cells infected by HPV, it doesn't matter which number, it doesn't matter if it's 6, 11, high risk, low risk, they show coilocytic change. What is coilocytic change? It's basically what you see in this picture. You're going to see this clearing of the cytoplasm, big white areas, and you're going to see a shrinking up of the nucleus. And if you can look up closely, it kind of looks like raisins. I don't really have a high def pick for you, unfortunately, so you're going to have to use your imagination a little bit. You get little, little raisin nuclei. That's coilocytic change. And risk factors for HPV are all sex related. So you can just use your common sense here. You don't have to memorize anything. It's just basically patients who have many sex partners, who have sex uh, early, uh, early age. That's risk factors for HPV. So what pathologies can HPV cause in the vulva? It can cause condyloma cuminatum. This is another word for genital warts. Uh, as we talked about before, genital warts, um, basically low risk cancer, 6 and 11, the low numbers. And there's usually no symptoms, but what it, just, what it looks like is cauliflower. And it can also appear not only on the vulva, but on the hands. But again, you can see all these cauliflowers. And I think that looks pretty nasty. And I think if you ever see this in real life, you really don't really want to eat any cauliflower anymore. Um, again, on histology, we talked about it. You see that coilocytic change right here. Okay. Now treatment, I don't think this is very necessary for so step one. If you're curious, you can uh, you can either put some medic topical medications that cause the uh, cause all those cells, all these wart cells to die, or you can just directly freeze them off, cut them off, and or you can just do nothing and have these cauliflowers on you. And you can wait for two years and they'll go away by themselves. Now let's talk about cancer. We're going to talk about talk about squamous cell carcinoma specifically. And because they're so similar in the vulva, vagina, and cervix, we're going to talk them all together. We're going to do some compare and contrast. So these all have the same pathophysiology, and that's HPV. That's why we talked about it. It's so important. HPV, remember we talked about it, high-risk strains, 1618, E6, E7, E6, do you remember what that, what that blocks? It blocks P53. Let's see. E7, what is that block? Blocks RB. Okay. And cells affected by HPV, they're going to show coilocytic change. The other things they're going to show on histology is um, nuclear atypia and increased mitotic activity. This is like the same for every cancer. So you don't have to remember that. Just remember coilocytic change. And eventually that's going to lead to squamous cell carcinoma. Now risk factors, uh, basically, obviously, if any risk factor for HPV is a risk factor for any of these cancers because that's the main pathophysiology. So again, early sex, multiple sex partners. And then additional risk factors for these cancers are smoking and immunosuppression. Smoking, obviously, is basically for every cancer. Immunosuppression is basically because your immune system can't fight off the HPV. You have HPV longer, you have more opportunity for dysplasia um, and then eventually cancer. Now, what? how does this present? I think if you know enough about cancers, you can just pretty much guess it. it. Presents like all cancers with bleeding. You can also get itching. You can get pain. And then if you're talking about vaginal and cervical cancers, you can see some discharge. Uh, if you're talking about vulvar cancers, you get leukoplakia, and that's this. Basically, all these arrows showing this whitish color change in the vulva, maybe a little bit of thinning. That's leukoplakia. Now, for step one purposes, I think of vag vag vaginal and cervical cancers is basically the same entity. Uh, the way you differentiate them is where the mass is located. If you see a mass in the posterior vaginal wall near the cervix, but it's on the vaginal wall, it is a vaginal cancer. If you see it on the cervix, it's a cervical cancer. Uh, for cervical cancers, the way you diagnose it, uh, we're going to talk about screening a little bit, or a little bit earlier. So there's some pap smears that we're going to talk about. But if you're suspicious, you're going to do a colposcopy. Well, it's a fancy word for taking a big magnifying glass and looking at the cervix and looking for any uh, abnormal looking areas. And if you see that, you're going to biopsy it, which is the same thing you do for pretty much every cancer. You're going to biopsy it. And complications of this is that, let's see, it can compress the ureters. So let's take our kidney. We've got some ureters coming out of the kidney. If you get a big cervical cancer here, and the cervix is around here, 
Uh, it's going to block up the ureter. You're going to get some dilation. And eventually, your kidney will fail and you die. So, vulvar cancers. We just talked about vulvar squamous cell carcinoma. Let's talk about other vulvar cancers. There's a non-HPV related etiology of vulvar squamous cell carcinoma. And that is long-standing lichen sclerosis. If you remember lichen sclerosis, you see an older woman. And uh, what happens is you get that chronic inflammation. Inflammation leads to dysplasia. You get cancer. Again, in contrast, HPV-related squamous cell carcinoma is seen in a younger woman in reproductive age. If it's an older woman of vulvar carcinoma, it's due to lichen sclerosis. For vaginal cancer, there's a couple other cancers. There's clear cell adenocarcinoma. Um, and it is related to DES exposure to the patient's mother. And that is when the patient was in utero. That is, the mother was pregnant with this patient, and the mother was exposed to DES. And then this patient is born and grows up and then develops clear cell adenocarcinoma. Again, it's related to DES exposure to the patient's mother. Okay. I just really want to emphasize that because I think I've forgotten it before. Sarcoma botryoides is another vaginal cancer, and it's one we can kind of know by its name. The other thing to know about it is that it's a rhabdomyosarcoma. A rhabdomyo basically means a uh, skeletal muscle. And so remember, if you remember sarcoma, it's a malignant cancer. So this is a malignant cancer of skeletal muscle, and you see it in young girls. So if you look at this word, botryoides, it's a weird word, and it's Greek for a bunch of grapes. Let's look at a bunch of graves with the Greek dude. And this is sarcoma varroides. It's basically the same thing. And that's how it's got his name. And that's how you remember it. So it presents with a bunch of graves protruding out of the vagina. Now, finally, cervical adenocarcinoma is another type of cervical cancer. And it accounts for 15% of cervical cancer cases. And it is also due to HPV infection. So now we can talk about cervical cancer a little bit more um, and we're going to start with uh, basically the pathophysiology of it so we're going to draw out our uterus right now okay so this is uh this right here that i've drawn out is the cervix okay now there's a couple of zones here that you have to be really aware of so First zone is the ecto. Let's see. First zone is the ecto cervix. We're gonna draw an orange here. This is the ecto cervix. This is squamous. And then the second thing we have to be aware of is inside. Actually, it's actually so the cervix is a long channel that enters. It's basically the entrance to the uterus. And this is called the endo cervix. Obviously, ecto endo makes sense. This is columnar cells. And then finally, in between these two, there's a region here called the transition zone. And this, for some reason, is where HPV loves. HPV loves the transition zone. And for that reason, HPV happens to infect these cells the most. It's basically transitioning from squamous to columnar cells. And this is where then you get cancer, you get cervical cancer here. And how do we prevent HPV, uh, cervical cancer, my apologies. We do that with pap smears. Basically, you, what you're going to do is you're going to take a, take a little swab of this transition zone here. And you're going to look for any coilocytic change. And if you do that, if you see any coelocytic change, that's when you're going to basically get the colposcopy and you're going to take a biopsy. So pap smears are very effective. Um, it's recommended that we start doing them at 21 year old and older. Okay. Um, and it has led to a, basically a great decrease in cervical cancer rates. And that's mainly been in cervical squamous cell carcinoma. It doesn't affect the, it doesn't catch the adenocarcinomas as much, but it's led to a great decrease in cervical squamous cell carcinomas. So now let's talk a little bit about, um, a little bit more about cervical cancer. Uh, we, again, we're going to look at our 
Look at our cervix here. I'm going to take a little chunk here. So this is the cervix on histology. And when you get a HPV infection, HPV infection is going to cause dysplasia. And it's going to start at the base. When it's, I'm going to look at it in three stages. The CIN1, CIN2, and CIN3. Basically, when it's one third of the way or more or less, that's CIN1. If it happens to extend, this dysplasia extends two thirds of the way, so you get dysplasia all the way up to here, you have CIN2. Okay. Um, now, CIN has a high likelihood of resolving by itself. So most of the time you see a patient with CIN, you do nothing, it goes away completely and you're all clear, okay? You're good, but sometimes it can progress and if, and if it progresses, it's gonna progress higher and higher, it's gonna rise and then you now have CIN2. And CIN2 can also just go away by itself if you watch it, nothing happens, it's all good. But, so let's go back to CIN2. If you're also unlucky, you can progress, and now you have CIN3. And that's basically everything except for this basement membrane. When you get involvement of the basement membrane as well, that is called carcinoma in situ. And eventually that becomes squamous cell carcinoma. Okay, so that concludes our first part of the cervical vaginal vulvar pathology.